Austin, what's up, man? What's going on, guys? How are we living? What's up? What's up? Man, perfect. Good timing. That's good. These kids are crazy, huh? <laughs> yeah, they're good. Oh, I love them. man, I love them. That was a heck of yes. a turnout. Dude, yeah, man, it was good. That was, that was really wow. good. That was really good. I think we'll get a lot more throughout these next few weeks as well. Absolutely, dude. It's fun dude, just to see the different faces, the different phases too of like development and different stages that they're in. Um, Jesse, I just unmuted you because I'm guessing you don't know how to do the mutes, <laughs> but I saw you talking. What's up, Jess? Can you hear oh, me? Hey, how you doing, buddy? You know, I, yeah, I had myself muted. Are you in? Are you in your classroom? No, this is my this is my office. Ah, nice. Home, you know. Working from home. What are you guys doing to adapt over there at Metro Tech? Are you guys doing uh, online? Are you recording videos for the? the yeah, I've been um, sending out videos of lessons and stuff I'm doing, and uh, any of the new stuff I give the guys that I can't put in the grade book, it's not going to affect their grade. Only they can like they have opportunity to redo things and like recover grades from the past, basically. So okay, I give them like, lessons every day though. And we have the we have like the ability to video chat like this too. Nice. Okay. So you got you got people coming in the video chats. Oh, what's up, dude? I haven't seen you in a while. Oh, <laughs> what? I saw the pic of you guys hiking yesterday on Facebook. It was amazing. Yeah, that's good. We good time. Were Micah, how are you, dude? Doing super fast. <laughs> Tell him he's taking over the conference call, I man. He, he's going to run. Right. It's all us. I hope everyone else is okay with that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm in. I'm he's all in. in. <laughs> I love it. Jeannie, how are you? Good to see you. Just saw Nakona on the on the athlete one. I was pumped to see him in there. Legend. Where's Grammy at? She's the... You've been working nights, so she's uh, just getting up and around. Yeah. I was just at my classroom. I haven't been able to be in there for about three weeks. Oh, oh my gosh. It's insane now. A lot of us, nobody, well, there's Jake's a teacher too. Um, I know there's a lot of other teachers in here for sure that none of us can even get in there. We've got to adapt. It's crazy. And just watching my brothers and sisters right now taking their online school, one, I think they're realizing how easy online school is. And now I know why I wanted to take it in college because I was like, gosh, if I could do online every day, this would be a, a cakewalk. I don't even need to go to school. Um, but two, it's, it's fun seeing it. What do you Hey, you got a bunch of BAM fam people in here. Love it. Jimbo, what's going on? Seeing all the BAM hats. We got Josh. We got Joe. Buffy's in here. George, you're looking old. <laughs> George, you know how to use this? Good to see you. Good to see you. Oh, now they can hear what you're saying. <laughs> we can all see that, George. Today's discussion is about attitude, George. It's perfect. I know. It's great. A great lead in. George great is going to be leader. our example. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> oh, man. Of course, he obviously gives the finger. He yes. doesn't know how to use this. Yes. <laughs> we can all see you. <laughs> oh, it's great. Oh, my God. Can you so, guys hear me? Yes. I've never used Zoom before. I have no idea what I'm doing. Well, you're Sound doing good. great. Perfect. <laughs> you're doing great. We'll get started in about one minute. There's still a few. I mean, I'll give them a couple of seconds. Still got any questions? And then we'll get rolling. While we're um, waiting, we can update you on the uh, the player session. I know some of you guys popped in from that one too, but we had over 200 people in the player session, hopefully some of your guys' players, but it was awesome to see um, that many players hopping on when they could just be playing video games or doing something else during this time. So our goal is to continue to grow that. I think the more coaches we have that are reinforcing that to their players, um, you know, the more players that will get in there as well, but you know, also just reinforcing it to other coaches. If you guys know people after today that you think this would be beneficial for, We'd love to fill the coaches group just as large as the player one. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And before we get going, let's see here. One second. Okay, well, we'll get we'll kick it off now. Two o five. We'll kick it off. Um, 
Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you guys for showing up here. And thanks for any of your players that were in the players one. It was incredible. I mean, all different ages from nine to 18. I'm just being able to get in there. I think to be able to utilize this time right now is huge. There's so much that, um, so much uncertainty with coaches, with athletes, with all of us involved in this community. And the more that we can rally together and support each other in any fashion is huge. Just to kick it off, like, None of us know it all. We're all young guys. We don't know. We don't know everything. We just want to share our experiences and some things that have worked with the programs that we're able to coach, some of the programs that we run, and some of the things that we've seen that work well. If there's anything that you do specifically with your program, with your athletes, that is beneficial and that you've seen some really good results with, please like feel free to chime in. Like really use the chat box. I'm um, hopefully we used it a little better than the kids did. With I don't even know. I just got a text from a kid. He's like, Coach, did you see what was in the chat after we left? I'm like, No. Do I ended the meeting? I thought nobody could see it. I don't know what it is. So now I'm nervous to check my phone in an hour to see what's on the chat box. <laughs> but um, but it's just really beautiful thing to see the athletic community rally together over something that is so drastic. I mean, something that none of us can control. Totally out of our circumstances. Um, unprecedented none of us have seen anything like this or even know how to handle this but we've handled it with courage with strength and the more that we rally together to rise each other up whether it's a call like this or whether it's bringing athletes on or maybe it's a call to one of our old friends or old coaches that used to coach us and just tell them how much this means to us um, just the impact they've had in our life I think that's something that's awesome to do it's cool to see we mentioned in the athlete one but there's coaches now not just athletes but coaches from as far up the Northwest, Washington, down to San Francisco, Marin County, Arizona, Reno, all the way up to New York, Buffalo, like all over the world, down South in Texas. This is incredible what we can do when we rally together. So thank you guys for making this possible because without you, none of this would be possible. A lot of good friends in here. I know these guys have a lot of good friends in here as well and, and teammates, coaches in this deal. Before we get started though, my name is Austin Byler. I run Major League University. Our whole goal is helping athletes through the mental side of the game, through leadership development, through peak performance training, really using our mind to help us become successful on and off the field. It's more about the off the field than the specific on the field results. And I think a lot of athletes get caught up in the results aspect and lose their identity. They lose who they are. Um, for us, we really like to focus on that side of the game because I think it's really important. Once you leave the game, who are you? And where's your identity? And what did you learn that the game teaches you every single day? This game will teach us so many different tools that we can use into our life. And you guys are living examples of those tools. So that's a little bit about what we do. I'm from Peoria, Arizona. Currently back here now during the shutdown. I was up in the Bay Area, uh, Marin County, coaching at a high school, as well as running um, my major league university stuff with some of the college programs up in the area until everything kind of got shifted. So I'm down here in Arizona for a few months, kind of just seeing how things settle. Um, played at the University of Nevada, Reno, played a little bit with the Arizona Dimebacks in, in their farm system, and then retired a couple years ago and started the MOU. So that's kind of a little bit about me. And, and we kind of collabed here to form Dugout Coalition and our whole goal is to help athletes and coaches develop more leaders in society, um, physically, mentally, through six tool training to really hit each aspect of the training system, which is what we'll be going over these next four weeks. So if you guys have any questions, if you have any concerns, if there's anything that you want to touch more on, please use the chat bar, email us, call us, text us. We don't use Snapchat in this group, I don't think as much as the kids, but I always tell them, hey, Snapchat me, TikTok me, do the cool dance, whatever it is. Um, we're open 24-7, 365 for anything. But Jake, I'll let you go ahead and kick it off, my man. Yeah, awesome. My name is Jake Banwert. I am president of Baseball and Fast Pitch Academics Midwest, um, which is a 2016 travel baseball softball organization in Indy. We've got a lot of faces in here of coaches, which is great to see. Um, I'm the head coach over at Perry Meridian High School as well. Um, we got our assistant AD in here too. What's up, Emily? Just hanging. Um, I have the privilege there of leading some once a week uh, mental training sessions for our athletes there as well. Um, and our big focus as BAM and FAM is really developing players with that six tool mindset, teaching them the mental side of the game, visualization, how to cast a vision, but also how to train, how to develop yourself as a player, how to take accountability for yourself and your actions um, and all of those types of things from uh, the physical side as well. So we're excited to be here. Um, I met Austin and Ronnie um, through what we're now calling Dugout Coalition and, and really just connecting through social media. And it's awesome to find like-minded individuals across the country that can really take what we were doing locally to more of a national level. And this is step number one in doing that. So we greatly appreciate you being here. I know, you know, we told the kids to write the questions in the chat with a group it's a little bit smaller, 
you know, if there's a pressing question you really want an answer to, feel free to unmute and just throw it out there too. We'll get to it. But um, really appreciate you guys being here. I know this is a strange time for all of us thinking that we were about to start our season to now being kind of stuck in quarantine. So the more that we can come together as a community, I think the better off we'll, our, we'll all be. Right. Uh, my name is Ronnie Burnick. I'm with Hot Corner Athletics in Buffalo, New York. A um, little background is I played at Canisius College in Buffalo, it's a small division one school. I spent two years as an assistant uh, at Niagara University in the same conference. Um, after that, I got into more of the skill development. I uh, initially started just as a private training coach. Uh, it has completely evolved into team training. Uh, and then recently we got into more of the sports performance market where instead of just doing uh, skill training, we got more into the, the performance type training on how to how to create um, better better bodies for people after baseball uh, and also help them get better with, with their bodies while they're actually playing. So um, we're big in the sports performance stuff. We're big in the skill training stuff. Um, we do work with teams, but uh, super, super excited to have Austin and, and Jake come together with this because we all bring, you know, completely different parts of baseball um, into one. So, again, super, super excited to be here. Um, if you guys have any questions on a performance front or on a, a skill training front, please ask. 100%, 100%. Well, Adam, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah. What's going on, guys? I'm Adam Gauker. I'm head coach at Lutheran here in Indianapolis. Uh, also a VP and co-founder of Bam Fam with Jake. Um, I primarily specialize in catching and speed and agility. Those are my main focuses. Um, but uh, as a coach, I'm real excited with about how many people we have in this right now that are willing to jump on and do some learning. Because uh, I've noticed uh, since I've started coaching, a lot of coaches out there doing more of just teaching. And then once they're at that point of that coaching level, they try, they kind of step away from the learning aspect. Uh, Jake and I always talk about our organization and us individually as coaches that if we're the same from year to year, then we're getting worse. And so I just love that you guys are all here. We're all here to talk about uh, a little bit of baseball during this weird time and learn a lot from each other and get better and use this time wisely. So I'm real excited to have everybody here. 100%. Thank you, guys. Well, let's get into it. Um, today, we're all talking about establishing a team-first environment. And for me, I've had one year to coach, so I'm not this expert on, hey, how do I establish a team-first environment? But gratefully, I got to play for one of the best head coaches in the nation, Jay Johnson. He's at University of Arizona. And some of the best uh, coaches in professional baseball between two different levels that were incredible at establishing a team-first environment. And this is one of my favorite things. And I was excited with the athletes, but I'm way more excited with the coaches because – it all starts it from the top down. Like leadership starts at the very tippity top with each one of us. And what we do and how we carry ourselves and how we in interact with the athletes is how they're going to perform and how they're going to interact with others and carry on for their future. So we have a huge vital role as coaches to really speak life into these athletes every single day and continue to encourage them. And um, Jake, I'll kind of let you kick it off with, with how do we establish that team mentality type of deal when it's such an individual sport? Baseball is so much failure. It's very individualized. You're, you're constantly seeking results and everything like that. But I know you've got some really good things that you're doing out there and some good insights to what you're doing that's worked for you. Yeah, for sure. I think a big thing, and I didn't realize this until I had my own kids and was a parent, but, you know, as a parent, you realize that your kids don't just – listen to what you say right they watch what you do they emulate that they start to become kind of the, the atmosphere that they're surrounded by and I think one of the things that a lot of coaches struggle with is you know we have these expectations on the field but then off the field it's just kind of free game um, especially in the travel ball world it's really easy to go and play two games and then go out to you know b-dubs with the team and you know while they're sitting there hanging out you end up seven and eight beers the, talking to all the parents and, and setting that example for your players, because in your mind, it's not really a big issue, but in the player's mind, they're watching what you do there just as much as what you do in the dugout. Figuring out ways, we talk to the players um, about their character, right? So figuring out ways to truly be a person or a character in their life that they can branch into and take hold of what you're doing and try to emulate that and that be a positive thing. Um, you know, one of the things we tell ours all the time is how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you as a coach are projecting two different personalities on the field versus off the field, then you're giving them permission to do the same thing. 
So we need to make sure that we're watching the way that we do that. And I think that goes a long way with just building rapport with the players, um, giving them opportunities to really trust you. And then, you know, one big thing is just allow them to, to get to know you, like individually off the field as a person. Um, I love that my players know my family personally. They, they know my kids. They say hi to them. Um, all of those things make you more than just a coach in a dugout. And the more that they respect you as an individual and as a person, then the more they'll buy into the things that you're telling them that may, they may not, may not um, necessarily agree with, you know, to start. So I think that's huge. Um, and I think, you know, one, one of the biggest things, if there's one like huge takeaway for me, it's the expectations that you have for players need to be the same for every single player. You know, you can go to any Facebook group and see coaches talking about, oh, yeah, well, you know, they say everything about coaches, kid, but I treat my kid, I'm so much harder on my kid. Well, why? That's just as bad as being more lenient on them. They're just another player on the team. So if you're really going to coach them like anybody else on the team, then that treatment should be the exact same, right? So that's really hard for a lot of coaches with their best players because you need them to win. So a lot of times our expectations for them off the field seem, but we almost have to use those opportunities when our, our star players or our leaders do screw up as an example for the other players to prove to them early and often that these are the expectations we have, no matter who you are, no matter what your college commitment looks like, no matter what you've done on the field, we're still holding you to this standard. And those standards are not something that we'll sacrifice just for one extra win or, you know, you having somebody in the stands that wants to see you that game, we're going to live by those every single day. So kids crave consistency. They crave that truly that program of that. They know exactly what the expectations are, because if there's any middle ground there where they don't know what to expect, then they're going to kind of try to figure that out and dip their toes in the water a little bit. So the more you can communicate and the, the more clear that communication is with expectations, um, I think it goes a long way in not only developing a good team, but a culture for many years to come with returning players where, you know, they buy into it. And then the really cool thing is when you start to see them take ownership of it as players to where you don't have to police it. Um, I'm really proud of our high school program because we had seniors this year that would truly police each other and police the rest of the program to where I just got to watch them do it. They knew the expectations of the program and they would police it themselves without it ever having to get to a coach. Um, and that's a really cool place to be when you get to watch your leaders develop to a point to do that. It takes time, but it only happens with that consistent effort. So consistency, consistency, consistency for sure from the coaching side. Jake, you mentioned something really big, and that's the clear communication. And I think it's very easy with all of our schedules, just knowing, just getting uh, my dab my feet in with it as actually being a coach this year and a head coach with a lot of responsibility with everything else going on and then seeing what my college coaches would have to deal with and what these professional coaches would deal with on a daily basis from upper management to school to teaching to my family life. I got to take care of my kids. I got to make sure I pay the bills. I got to make sure my car's got gas and I got to make sure I don't get in a crash on the, on the way home. Like there's so much responsibility, but clear communication prevents so much failure and it, it clears yes. so many different things up. Even if it's like, Hey guys, look, I'm not going to be around for the next week. Like, I just want you to know. So if you reach out to me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going on a trip or I'm going here. I'm doing this. Just being clear with our communication is massive and, and empowering the athletes. I mean, I think all leadership starts at the top with how do we empower the ones below us? How do we empower our guys or our girls to become successful? And if they can take ownership of their career, it, it gives them a sense of entitlement, a sense of pride in their roles on the team, whether that's I'm the bench guy, but I'm here to rah, rah, and pump the team up, or I'm the starting shortstop hitting three, hitting bombs, and I'm the, the go-to guy on the team. Well, guess what? We're empowering our athletes to become successful. Ronnie, what do you got with what's worked with you? And, and even at Niagara, when you were coaching over there for a couple of years, what are some things that you're looking for to establish that team first environment? Because we, we all know this doesn't happen overnight. If there was an overnight pill that made it happen, just sign me up, take me to the pharmacy. But guess <laughs> what? There's none of that happening. So what would you do, Ronnie, to help establish that environment early? Yeah. So as a player, it was, it was, uh, it was really seen as a player. And, and I, and I, I said this all the time as a coach is every single year, you got a new group of kids, you know, every year you got a new call, like a, a culture that you have to uphold, you know what I mean? And that's, and that's the one thing we've got to look at culture first. We got to look at team first. So sometimes, I mean, this is unfortunate, but sometimes your best players are expendable only because they're not buying into what your culture is. And I saw that as a player, 
it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you're the best player on the team or the worst player on the team. You were treated the exact same every single day. It's the same thing whenever I was a, a coach in Niagara. I mean, a lot of the times, whoever was performing on the field were the ones that kind of had control of everything. And I think that that is the wrong mentality. I mean, if you if you hold everybody to the exact same standard, and you're and you're making sure that all your players are on the same level, you know that that makes for a really good culture for the team and understanding that it's team first and everybody's here for each other. You know, that's the one thing that I saw as a player was it didn't matter. You know, if a kid wasn't doing what he was supposed to during the week, that kid didn't play that weekend as a, when I was playing. And that's the one thing that made us really good was, you know, it, it, there was always that standard to uphold. And it was based on the culture that we were trying to put, put together for a team. And that's the one thing that I really liked about playing in the organization that I did was it was a team first always. It didn't matter if you're batting 500 or if you're a red shirt or – you know, if you're a bullpen guy or if you're a starter, like it didn't matter. Every single person had their role. They had to play within that role. And it's either get on the bus with the rest of the team or, or you're going to be left behind. And that's the one thing I said to the players too is it's time to jump on board with your team. Whatever your coaches and the players are doing and the culture that you're trying to create, I mean, that's, that's the way that we're going as a team. And you got to jump on board with that. There are going to be some things that you don't like. There are going to be some players who are going to try and, and push the limits and, and get to whatever that line is. Yeah, but you got to stay true to what you want to develop as your culture, as a coach, um, in a private setting and in a team setting. You got to make sure that you're developing that culture so that every single person that walks in the door or goes onto that field understands the expectations. And I think that's how you grow as a team, whether you're, you know, a five and 40 team or a 40 and five team. If you develop the same culture, you're going to see over the course of a couple of years how you guys consistently get better. And I think that's really big is that consistency in culture is huge. Yeah, that's big time. Adam, um, go ahead and take it off, but I want to get into something right after you get going because there's something popped in my mind about the expectation piece. But but what are you doing over there in Indiana? Absolutely. So one, one big thing I look for, uh, I'm going to piggyback off a little bit of what Jake said. Jake said kids crave consistency. I also think they crave like inspiration. And we talked about in the last class about surrounding yourself with like-minded people and people that want that are better than you and that would push you. Like I, as a coach, try to – uh, not only provide disciplines for the kids that they have to uphold to, but show them the same disciplines in myself and show them the disciplines that I hold myself to. I think I always drove me nuts as a player when I had coaches barking orders or doing all, uh, saying all these things that I'm thinking in the back of my head going, like, I'm not even sure you would do this on your own. So I like as coaches for us to jump in and do things with the kids, uh, showing them how much time and effort we put into educating ourselves and, um, you know, maybe scouting for other teams and letting them know that, like, we have disciplines ourselves as coaches. We're not just having these high expectations for you. We have – just as high as expectations for ourselves as coaches, if not higher, you know, like we have people like, like George, George is like 80 years old, but he can bench press like 400 pounds and he makes me feel weak. So I like to make sure that I am, you know, providing those same disciplines for myself. So those kids can see that reflected. And it's not just an expectation on them. It's an expectation throughout. And I think kids nowadays really respect that. Um, and they respond to that. So they not only crave that consistency, but they crave that inspiration. And that's going to really help instill that culture that Ronnie was talking about, because culture takes a long time to instill and get uh, and get hold in. But I think if you start from the beginning, make those clear expectations and show that it's reciprocated in that coach to player relationship that we're going to work just as hard, if not harder than you, it's a good challenge thing. I think it really helps build it a lot quicker. Very good, man. I really like that. You guys said a lot about the expectations. You know, a lot about setting the expectations early. And something that I noticed with some of the best teams that I was a part of and just some of the best managers that I got to play for was we set the expectations day one. Like, there was no waiting around for a week or two weeks and then, hey, we'll, we'll kind of fiddle around and play in the ocean and then see what happens. But, no, it's from day one, the expectations are clear. This is when you show up. We're on Lombardi time if you're a coach that likes the Lombardi time uh, type deal. Or if you're somebody who says, hey, we're going to go three hours every day, but we're going to be in, out, boom, boom, boom. We're going to move with the pace. We're going to compete in practice. One of my favorite high school coaches here in Arizona, coached at Liberty High School for anybody who's, who's a local coach here, incredible guy. Took over the program a few years ago, won a championship the first year, been to the championship a couple more times. And I asked him, hey, what's your key to success? Because you were, were an assistant coach for like 10 years. I know you always wanted to be a head coach. What was your key to success? He says, in practice, we compete. I put them in stressful situations every single practice because we're going to compete and get used to them. So when we get to the game, we're going to be prepared for those situations. And it's not the first time they've seen bases juice, two outs, bottom of the seventh with the three-hole hitter up, who's the all-state player of the year in the box. What do we do? 
right? We're creating those situations early. So I want to talk a little bit about how do we set those expectations early? And, and Jake, you can kick us off with that. But some things, at least that popped to my mind is whether it's a team meeting before the season even starts to say, hey, here, here's our squad. This is what we're going to do. Here's my three expectations. Here's my three rules or guidelines, whatever verbiage you want to use for that. Here's what we're going to do. And this is who we are as a team. No matter if we're a high school travel organization, if we're a collegiate program, if we're a totally different program, like whatever program we're running, these are the expectations. These are what we're going to hold you to, the standards, right? We've seen it in the chat, like holding yourself to high standard. And this is how we're going to live by it. This is who we are. This is our identity as a team. And this is who we're going to be. Um, Jake, what are some things that, that we could use to set those expectations early to make sure that we eliminate some of that noise and have clear communication? Yeah, I think the big one as you're setting team standards, um, players feel more attached to team standards that they feel like they've had a role in developing. And mm -hmm. I think as adults, we're all very capable of having a conversation in which they feel like they have a say, even though we know the end result that we're trying to get to and we're going to get there either way. Um, but just including them in that conversation is a huge piece in that. So, you know, um, George just put in the chat, Matt Deggs, the wolf pack mentality. That was our book, um, our book study for our high school team this year that we're still going to go through this summer but it's a great book that talks about team culture and one of the big things is setting a standard like what does that look like and you know the word rules kids tend to be okay with breaking rules when you're holding them to a standard um, or an expectation that you're also modeling as a coach it's easier for them to follow that and I think one of the big areas that's a red flag um, for a lot of teams is you need to be very, very aware of the communication that you have with assistant coaches or with the rest of your staff in front of players. There's a, a lot of times there's a big disconnect when you and your staff, you can disagree. That's great when coaches disagree. You want those different perspectives. But when that conversation goes sideways and there's a clear disconnect between coaches in game or in practice of what expectations are, then players see that and they don't believe anything you're saying as a coach or as a staff because they see that you're divided. So the more together you seem, the more together the team will be willing to, to follow within that. I think another big thing for them is just routine. Um, we know it's a monotonous game and everybody tries to find different ways to make practice fun and exciting and do that. But to have a first 20 minutes or first 30 minute of practice routine to where our kids know, for example, at our practice, at 2.05, they're in the locker room. They have 2.05 to 2.10 to change. And when they do that, every item of clothing they put in their locker, they mentally think through something negative from their day that they're leaving in their locker with that item of clothing. At 2.10, coaches say, let's go. We go out to the field. They take their position. They have 10 minutes of on-field defensive visualization. They know their first 20 minutes of practice with Aussies, with positionals, all of those things, and they've seen the practice plan so that they have a general idea of expectations of what we're going through that day because we're not trying to surprise them, right? We want to get what's the best out of them and for them. So them knowing what to expect is a big piece to that. So we'll go through that, and then there's 10 minutes after practice of visualization for offensive, um, and then we split them into different wolf packs to where each group is responsible for different cleaning on the field, whether that's, you know, um, raking the field or cleaning the dugouts or uh, sweeping the locker room. There's different groups each week so that they know those expectations. And the other thing that does is it allows you to empower leaders within your team to be in charge of those different groups. And it allows them to develop their leadership skills as well by actually taking charge of making sure that their task is completed. So I think routine is huge for them um, as a team. I think the relationships that you model um, will be taken more seriously than what you physically say or talk about. Um, they're going to watch what you do, which is huge. Um, and, and sticking to those standards and expectations is big because we've all done it as a coach to where you have them. And then you're going into a game and you're like, man, but I really need this kid. And it's really easy to sacrifice in the moment because you want to win that game. We're all competitive. So figuring out where that is and making sure that you're not sacrificing that just for a, a momentary win um, or a small goal that you have, right? We always have to value the infinite game um, as the most important thing in our lives. Like what can we teach them? Okay. Well, how they play at 13, you will not be remembered and it won't be a big deal um, in regards to like 
them going to college. I've never heard a college coach ask for somebody's 14 youth stats of the summer that they played. So although those things matter to the players, we need to value their development as a person more than just their development physically as a player and just a winner or loss. I love that, Jake, about valuing the actual person, man, and, and showing the value. And somebody I like to read, for any of you who love to read, or audio books, very simple, very easy podcast. Simon Sinek, the dude's, I mean, he's been around for a while, but he's got some fuego. I mean, I'm reading Leaders Eat Last right now, and I am locked. And usually for me, I never really take notes on books. I'll highlight, but I don't take notes. And this one, I, I brought out the notepad. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to actually take notes on this because this guy is just freaking bringing the noise on this but about creating value and helping our athletes feel valued and loved and cherished. I know the worst, I had two experiences. My first two years of college, I played for an old school coach. He was there for 31 years. It was his way or the highway. He was very old school mentality. My mental toughness, my type of mental toughness is 5 a.m. weights, 6.30 a.m. conditioning and practice till 12. And then you can go do your school. And as an 18 year old going into college, that's not the coolest thing to do in the world. It sucks. It was terrible. And I'm like, man, I want to leave. This sucks. But Coach Powers, like, now looking back, we're great friends, and I see what he wanted to get out of us, but I think there's a better way to do it sometimes, but he really demanded a lot, and it was that old school mentality of that mental toughness, and then going with Coach Johnson, who set the standards early, who set the expectations and valued us, made us feel valued, like our voice was heard with Coach Powers. I mean, love the guy to death, but if we brought up an idea to him, it was his way or the highway. It didn't matter what we said, and that made us as athletes resent him. We hated it. So we rallied together around it because we didn't want to play for the guy. But understand the other side of the spectrum, when we felt valued, we had the same type of team and we ended up winning 42 games at Division One in the Mount West the following year with not the – we had good talent, but not the most talented team in the world. And it was all because as athletes we felt valued. Jake, I want to mention a real quick point before we move on to Ronnie is what would you say – and this is – I'm very intrigued to hear this. What would you say – to a coach in here who thinks that they don't have enough time to do the visualization. And here's why I say this. I went down to Florida and I didn't realize that the Gator Swamp is real and that it's a little different out there. And I was maybe not, my West Coast mentality was not taking place in Florida very well. It's a little more old school. Um, caught me off guard, note to self. But I went out there and I was doing visualization at a showcase. And there's a bunch of college coaches there. And one of the college coaches came in here and excuse my language, but he goes, Father, why are you doing this? I said, because we want to see ourselves succeed. It's all about feeling it and seeing it because the more that I can do this on a consistent basis, like these kids are going out to perform in front of you. And it's very stressful. I'm putting myself in those situations. Every one of us can put ourselves back in those. And we're freaking out when there's a scout in the stands or a coach that could potentially be our next manager. We're freaking out. We want to get to that level. Well, I'm like, hey, let's calm the mind, right? Get in our zone. And he goes, we don't got time for that shit down here. I'm like, wait, whoa, what coach? You, you're at a junior college. There's no rules or regulations. I know you're not the NCAA because you guys actually have regulations in NCAA. Give me a break. How don't you have time for this? So what would you say if someone's like, hey, I don't have time to do five minutes of visualization in my practice plan? The first thing I would, I would ask is if we can add them to our schedule because that's a guaranteed win. Um, <laughs> we're not going to invest in things that matter, then that's great. Like we, those are the teams we want to play against. That's awesome. But um, in all seriousness, I think, we oftentimes struggle with prioritizing and I think coaches are the same way. There's a lot that you're trying to get done development wise for these kids and you're having to pick and choose like what to value more. Um, I would say scientifically speaking, um, it's been proven that one minute of, of visualization or mental training is equivalent to six minutes of physical practice. So five minutes wow. of visualization is a half hour of practice. So when you look at it like that, um, you can see the value in that for sure. But I think it's a matter of perspective. If, if it's a coach that isn't going to value it and place an emphasis on it, then, you know, it's, it's their program. They can choose to do that. But um, from the personal side of it, we've seen so much growth from players who were five o'clock guys, right? They killed it in, in pregame and then in the game they struggled um, until they started visualization. And then the nerves went away and you started to see the best out of that player. Uh, so it's one of those things like, I've seen this demonstration. It's awesome. There's ping pong balls and basketballs in this trash can. And when you put in the things that, that aren't as important first, right, you put in the little things, the ping pong balls and the golf balls and all of that, there's not room left in your bucket or in your time to get everything else in. But when you keep the main thing, the main thing, and you prioritize properly, you put in all the big stuff first, then it's amazing how much of the little stuff you can still fit in. So I think from a visualization side, 
sure you're losing five minutes of practice, but what you're gaining is after those five to 10 minutes, you now have players that are actually focused on their tasks. So a drill that would have taken you 30 minutes now takes 20 because they know what the expectations are. They've watched themselves and actually felt themselves doing that. So you get through everything that you would have anyways. It's just more focused and more intentful practice than it would have been if you didn't do that. So I don't, I personally from doing it both ways, because we haven't always done the visualization, um, have seen so many benefits from doing it to where we haven't had to adjust what we're trying to get out of a practice at all. But you also have to understand that there are players and coaches out there that just are set in their ways and won't change. Um, and that's fine. We, we see those all the time in Indy. And what we tell them is like, look, this is who we are. We're transparent about it. And it's either you're going to do that and buy into what we're doing. And we'd love to have you. Or if you don't want to do that, that's fine. But this is not a place that you're going to be successful. So within our specific programs, you as the coach get to set that standard and expectation. And you either keep players or if they decide they don't want to do that, um, you know, if you're high school or travel, whatever that looks like, you get to choose every year as the player does um, if you bring them back or if they're still a part of, of that culture and that team. But I think it's when you look into the benefits of it, um, I think it's absolutely crazy to think that somebody wouldn't have time um, if they're choosing to do that. I think that's more of an ignorant statement than the coach really not having time. Sometimes we just don't know until we learn about it. So you as coaches, I think it's awesome that there's so many in here because it shows a willingness to continue to learn and grow. Um, and Adam and I have said all the time, like the moment that we say this is our program and it's set in stone is the moment that we need to stop doing what we're doing because there's always ways to improve and grow and learn and collaborate. Um, and that's, that's how we get better at what we do for all of us. So I think that's a huge step. I love it. I love it, man. The visualization is huge. I mean, it's so massive. And do you talk about that, that open growth mindset, the abundant mindset that you guys do possess? You could have easily said when, when I wanted to come up there and do some seminars with the athletes and work with them, you could have said, we're good. We do this ourselves. We got it, but you're like, dude, let's make something happen. Let's collaborate. And this is through social media where you don't get to hear the energy or you don't get to see the face necessarily. You just see the outside persona that somebody puts on. You don't get to know who they are. So that's that was incredible. I'm forever grateful for that, man. I think it's awesome what you guys are doing out there. And that's just great insight, right? We can maneuver the practice plans to put in five minutes that's going to help us for the future. And it's not only just the physical side, it's the it's the life skills that they learn yes. through that to be able to calm the breath to be able to process through the emotions all the different things our athletes are going through a lot i got a sister that's 14 freshman in high school unbelievable brother who's 16 in high school or 17 sorry a junior in high school and they're going through a lot and the pressures that they face and the snapchats that are going around and like the different comparisons that we have to compare ourselves to every single day as a, a male or female athlete or person in general just a child nowadays is unbelievable to be able to give them a tool that can set them up for life when they get out of school is massive and I said in the last one but I'm gonna say it again we're gonna create something innovative where we, where we switch the school system around to where the first hour of the day is our hour it's the power hour we're gonna do gratitude we're gonna visualize we're gonna breathe we're gonna do affirmations we're gonna tell somebody we love them we're gonna learn a, learn a life skill that's gonna set us up for success once we get out of here. And then we can get into the math equations and the science and all the nonsense that gets into it that we gotta do. But guess what? That's just me, I love that stuff. Ronnie, what do you got for us about establishing expectations earlier and establishing that culture? Yeah, I got a couple of things. Uh, the first one is players will buy into what we believe in and we're passionate about. So a player might not, a player has to know that we're very passionate about something for them to buy into it. You know, for instance, if a, if a coach isn't very serious about visualization, well, then those players aren't going to take that part of it very seriously. You know, for me personally, I'm a very visual person. I like to visualize. I meditate. I like to meditate a lot. My players don't understand that that's very serious to me. If the guys that I work with individually don't think that that's very serious, well, then I'm not doing my job uh, to instill that into them, right? Um, so they're going to buy into what we're passionate about, and that's very, very important, I think, number one. The second thing is, is practice management. If we don't think that we have time to do something, well, then we need to do a better job as coaches is to, is to plan our practice a little bit better. we got to make sure that we understand exactly what we want to get out of today, right? And if visualization is the first thing that we want to get out of every day, that needs to be what we put into every single practice plan for the first five minutes. So having an actual detailed practice outline of what we're looking for is important. Um, I know a lot of coaches that just go into practices and they just say, okay, well, what are we going to do today? I think that that has to be pre-planned. 
I think that having a good practice plan and understanding what you want to get out of that specific day is very important. And then if you get done with it early, perfect. Move on to some competition, some game stuff. Um, but understand that practice management is number one, at, at least for me, only because I want to make sure that a lot of these guys understand, here's our goal for today. Boom, let's go. Yep. Um, winning in the locker room, right? For me, being a young college coach at the time, you know, I, I did have a player on the team I was coaching that was older than me. Right. That's hard. It's really hard to win the locker room because they might not take you seriously. And so I think that we have to win it first. Day one, understand expectation. This is what we do. This is how we do it. It doesn't matter if I'm 23, if I'm, if I'm 43, if I'm 53, if I'm 63. You have to understand what our expectations are. Win the locker room on day one. Um, and then two more things is consistency. Uh, in order to empower our athletes, we have to be consistent. Some days we're going to show up to the field and we're not going to have a good day, whether we had a bad day at work, something at home's not going very well. We have to show up every single day for those athletes, no matter what's going on in our own lives. That's number one, consistency and the way that we treat our players. Just because we had a bad day doesn't mean we got to take it out on Johnny who made an error to lose a game, right? We got to make sure that we're consistent in our attitude every day with them. Um, and then the last thing is baseball is our platform to change lives, right? It's our platform, mm. right? We utilize this game to change the lives of, you, of younger players, right? I know for me, Baseball ends. It does. It ends for every single person. Some guys, when they get to high school, they don't make their high school team. Some guys before college, some guys in professional baseball. There's only a very select few of us that get to play for, play the game for, our, for the rest of our lives. And those are the guys that we watch on TV, right? So I think for us, we have to use this platform to change the lives of young kids, empower them to be better people for whatever workforce they decide to go into. This is just our platform to get that out of them, right? And, and if, they, if they know that we love them and we believe in them, then no matter what they get into in their lives, they're going to remember us as being a, a, empowering them and making an impact on them, whether they're 12 or 15 or 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So I think overall, I think practice management's huge, understanding it and helping them know what your passion is. And then using our platform, which is baseball. I mean, look at all the people that are in here. Use this platform to, to help change the lives of younger kids, I think is the reason why we're ultimately doing this. Yes, 100%, man. You hit the nail on the head with that. I wrote that down in caps because that's the best, really what we do. Like that, it fires me up. And when I write things in caps, it means I'm fired up. <laughs> I, get, I get amped up. But it's so true because we have this platform to influence the next generation. Like let's develop leaders. Let's develop like young men and women who are going to go into society prepared, equipped, ready to go because we know they're not getting somewhere else. And maybe some of them are coming from different backgrounds at home. Some of us are in different economical backgrounds as well with our schools that we coach or teach at. But we play a vital role. Some of us have parent a, um, a, a parent figure like a mom or a dad um, just massive roles in these kids lives and we can all think back to I'm thinking back right now to Little League you know playing for my pops and for one of the other coaches we can think back to some of these monumental moments in our life where a coach really influenced us whether they said hey great job right there Johnny that was a great swing or nice job getting that tag down that was really cool or, hey how's your family doing or go to Chuck E. Cheese and, and playing the video games and getting a pizza and a big thing of Dr. Pepper like just having fun with each other is so key and massive. Adam, what do you got to add on to that? Yeah, I, you guys have touched on a lot, a lot of things that I, that I was thinking about. The, um, I, I like the idea, Jake and I both do this. We sending out the practice plans, establishing to the guys early on that every minute of every day is important and that you make time for the important things. We're all bogged down with all kinds of stuff that we have to be doing, but we all find learning as coaches to be important. So we've made time for this today, even in the midst of everything else that's going on, we've made time for that and we don't skip out on that. So, I mean, when I had a call out meeting at Lutheran this year, uh, none of those kids had ever met me that yet. This was my first time there. I'd never met any of them, but I provided a, a, a meeting agenda that, that we stuck to a T as far as time is concerned, just to show them an establishment early of that we value time. We try to get out as much, much as we, as we possibly can. Um, one thing as a coach that uh, I like to try to do is when we provide these practice plans that I see a lot of other coaches that we coach against not doing. And I, I get excited. Like Jake said, you know, I hope we can play them more often because we think we're going to get a W about it is, is being present for the things that you find are important. If you are talking to athletes that about your warm ups got to have intent behind it and uh, your uh, long toss has to have uh, certain purposes and everything you're doing based on position. If you're just not present for those as coaches and, you know, not, critiquing and helping make kids better it's going to be hard for them to not take those things seriously if you 
are a coach that shows up 20 minutes into practice because you don't feel like you got to be there for the stretching, for the warm-ups, and all that other stuff for the visualization, it's going to be hard for the kids to see that same value in it if you aren't providing that yourself. And I don't think you have to be out there babysitting the kids, but showing them that, yeah, the entire practice is planned and we're going to be out here getting everything that we can. And I'm not going to just show up late. As soon as you step away from that consistency of those disciplines, it gives those kids an opportunity to do the same thing. So as coaches, you know, we're thinking about this is the coaches section, you know, the previous one we were talking to athletes, like what can you guys do to get better? We need to do that as the same thing as coaches. Jake and I always, when we're coaching together, as soon as the game is over, we don't normally just leave. We normally stick around and say, Hey, what can we do? Even if we won to play the perfect game we or we felt like we did, we uh, ended up kicking the crap out of the other team. We ask ourselves, what can we do in those situations to make ourselves better for the next time out? And I think that it's important for us as coaches to make that apparent to the kids, to make sure that we're showing up on time, like we're preaching to them, everything that we preach to them, we got to do the exact same thing. So don't skip out on a day for, of your, uh, of your practice planning, make sure they're getting that ahead of time. Make sure that you're staying on task. If you are doing those things, it's going to be, uh, you're going to be like sponges to it. And they're going to really buy into that. And you know, the earlier you do that, the better. And, but as soon as you stray away from it, then you got problems on your hands. So being consistent as coaches and the things that we practice for ourselves, makes that um, much easier for the kids to do, I think. Adam, we ask our, we ask so much out of our athletes to be consistent on the field and consistent in the preparation, but it all starts with us being consistent as well. Yeah. We set a really good example, and I'm going to get into two things. Before anything, I want to comment on what Josh said there. I want more for you than I do from you. <laughs> Mic drop, hashtag wisdom nugget of the day. Dude, that is fire. <laughs> Thanks for putting that in there, bro. But, like, seriously, I want more for you than I do from you. I don't need you to help me get a championship. I don't need you to help me get to college if I want to be a college coach one day. I don't need you to help me win in the NC or in the NCAA World Series. Like I don't need any of that. But guess what I do need? Like I want more for you and more for you to help you for your career. I want to help you become the young man and the young woman that you're meant to be. And my coaches even, we have the opportunity for a head coach in here or an assistant coach, we can encourage our coaches the same exact way. Um, I had a question come in from Josh and he's up in Alaska running a program there. Um, 14U, um, 10 through 14, I believe. Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, or 8 through 14. Um, so a bunch of teams, right? A bunch of teams. And he asked, how do you establish this culture with some kids that are younger, maybe a little younger, but they they still get it, but they're maybe not as intellectually there as maybe the 16, 17, 18Us um, at some of these high schools. And I want to just uh, shout somebody out in here. Tom Connors, he's in here. He's not on the video, but he's got the mic on. And he's running a, a program called Marin Baseball up in Northern California in San Rafael area. And I was, I'm new to Northern California. Like I said, I'm from Arizona. I'm back there right now, but I was up in Northern California for a year and I got connected somehow, some way through the, through the amazing network that baseball brings us to be a part of Marin Baseball. And I saw how things are meant to be done. And I can only assume that's what you guys are doing with the Bam Fam, which you're doing Ronnie over at Hot Corner, but it was unbelievable. These kids got optional yogas. They got optional weights. They've got options to go on Sunday practices. They got options to do all this. And it's not about the tournaments. It's not about all these different things. It's about the development of our athletes. How are we creating good young men in our society on and off the field and doing some of the things to create that discipline? So I don't know if you guys have any, any ideas, Jake, you've got a ton of programs there with Adam of how to implement that culture for the younger athletes. But what I've noticed is one clear organization like clear communication and organization from the top is huge. So when you get to practice, everything's set up. It's ready to go. I mean, it's one high school field. And we got four or five different teams practicing on one high school field with one cage, mind you. It's unbelievable the efficiency that they can get out of a practice with the whole program, with multiple teams. It's un I'm mind blown, mind blown. Like if there's a template of how it should be done, that needs to be written. So Tom, if you're listening still, like, dude, write a book about this. It's incredible. But um, to be efficient, I think you've got to have everything set up ahead of time. You've got to have your coaches on the same page, which is really big time. Like your message needs to be relayed throughout your coaching staff, whether it's the 12U coach, the 8U coach, or the 14U coach. That's huge. And then embracing the kids and allowing them that, hey, let's have some fun still. I guess we want to get better. Yes, we want to be competitive when we go out. We don't want to get molly whopped every game but we do want to have some fun like we want to enjoy the game we want to enjoy our teammates and camaraderie with this moment that we have today but jake i don't know if you guys have anything that you're doing that's really stuck out to you in your years of, of handling your program yeah i think there's there's a couple big things that come to mind right away um you know number one it's training your coaches to be on the same page 
Um, you know, you have to decide if you're in, if you're in a travel program, there's a few different options. You know, there's travel programs that are essentially 20 teams in the same uniform that don't know each other and there's no real program. It's just kind of a, a uniform that you put on. Um, and that's not a knock on that, but you have to decide if that's what you want to be a part of and you want to like truly be responsible for just your team. Um, and then there's some that are more of programs and, and that's what we're trying to run to where, you know, we have quarterly coaches training to break down, Hey, here's our expectations. Here's our coaches evaluation system. Here's, you know, some of the things that we want to see you doing. We have a common language that we speak within the BAM fam of our hitting approach and our defensive expectations and our prep step. Um, and then the second thing I think is giving the players an opportunity to practice with players within the program that might not be on their individual team. I think one of the really cool things for us is, you know, watching our 10U team practice followed by our 17U team um, and having them side by side during our positional workouts, because you know how it was when you were eight to 10 years old, you look at those kids in high school baseball and you think like, wow, these kids are celebrities. Like they're the coolest kids ever. So it does two things for us. One for the younger age group, it allows them to see a clear vision of where they could go. Um, and then for the older age group, it gives us the opportunity to talk through the legacy that they're leaving and what they get to instill in the younger generation. Um, and we have, I saw Jim Wolf in here, but um, he has a couple kids within the program that are a little bit older and have done a great job of like truly latching on and investing into the younger players to where like they want to be like those players. So now you have a kid giving back and truly living out that vision of like what their life could look like and being selfless. And that motivates them to do better. And you have a younger player who looks up to somebody within the program now and thinks like, man, I want to practice like that. And I want to work as hard as he works or she works to get to that point. So I think whatever you can do program wise to create consistent language and to give players an opportunity to really work together um, is a huge piece to developing a true program where, where all of that kind of interacts with itself. Adam, Ronnie, do you guys have anything to add on to that at all? Yeah. I'd say the um, only other thing that we do, go, go ahead, Ronnie, you're good. Thanks, man. Um, the only, the only big thing for me is, I mean, we get like for us, at least we, we're more in the private section. So we do a lot of private training, group training, performance training, but the, but the language and like Jake said, it's all the same. Like I got a couple guys now who are professional um, guys in different organizations that come back and they train with us in the off season. They're all learning different things within their own organizations. But what we do is we want to talk the same language. And the only reason why is because what might make sense for, uh, them may not make sense for a 10 year old. And so we want to make sure that the conversations that we have with each person is the exact same. So for whatever reason, if they're not working with that specific coach in a, a certain week, and let's say they're working with me or they're working with a different guy, we're not going backwards. We're only, we're only taking steps forward. So no, no matter what happens, the language is the same. And the biggest thing that I see is the buy-in from the coaches too. Like, like we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of ego within the baseball coaching world, right? There's a lot of ego, a lot of people who think they know everything. I definitely don't. I'm definitely learning every single day. Um, but it's just buy-in. So any coach that comes into our places, buy into what we're teaching, buy into what we're talking about, because we're able to help kids differently than obviously just hitting a baseball and just throwing it. But we want – the biggest thing for us is buy-in. I get a lot of coaches a lot of times who say, you know, I've coached this way for so long and it has kind of worked. So I've just been doing this. So we need to make sure that we're buying into what we're trying to do and learning together, which I think is the biggest thing. I've been taught so much by the younger guys that work in my place. And I know I've taught them a lot and us working together has helped so many of the younger players that come into our place, but it's buy-in from everybody. You know, there is no tier to it. I'm not at the top of my facility. I'm not at the top of my place. I'm just like every other coach that's in this place because I need to learn from them and they need to learn from me. So once you buy into your organization and, and learning from each other, I think you see massive benefit, you know, and, and you're, like we, like we said about the culture, like your culture is just going to get better. You know, because if a guy in the cage next to me is teaching me something and then two minutes later I'm teaching them something, the kids see that. You know, so they're not nervous to turn around and say something to the other kid that's in the other cage. They're not nervous to go and talk to the other player that may be struggling with something. I think that brings the camaraderie together. You know what I mean? I think so buy-in is buy our biggest thing is we want to get our coaches to do the same things that we're trying to do, buy into our training system, and then learn with each other. That's our biggest thing. Love it. Yeah.
And then, uh, like, it, Ronnie touched on something exactly I was going to touch on. We have about 50 coaches in our organization, and um, I don't think that any of them feel that they can't come in and present ideas to us and or, or present a, a potential way of changing the way that we want to do something. We always start out every tryout, at every coach's meeting with everything. Jake and I are always talking about how – we are under no impression that we do everything the, the absolute correct way. We're always looking to change. We're always looking to adapt and we're always looking to get better. So we try to provide as much training as we possibly can, but if that training's not improving over time and we're not listening to our coaches and hearing those voices, um, then we're not getting better as an organization. We want everybody to help develop their, their own voice, whether it's a first year coach or a five year coach to continue to help build upon that. We also have, you know, one day where we come in, everybody just starts talking about some drills that they have to help us drill our build our drill library and kind of talk through those things and then I believe all of our coaches do a really important thing as far as helping these kids gain that leadership is when those times pop up that those kids want to present themselves as leaders they give them the opportunity uh, when I'm doing instruction or I'm working with kids on our team I'm a big believer and I tell them that the best way to be able to teach somebody uh, to, and to be able to do something well is to be able to teach somebody how to do it so mm -hmm. I try to give athletes the opportunity to when something comes up that I want to show them how to do it either have the athlete demonstrate it or if there's an athlete that I know that does it very well and that has presented themselves as a person that wants to try to be a leader because I think leaders appoint themselves if, if you're going out there and just slapping a C on an, a senior's uh, jersey just because he's an older guy that may not be the person that the kids want to listen to if a kid steps up and he's starting to show some of those leadership qualities provide those opportunities and I think that um, us as coaches do that very well they let the kids teach the younger kids and even the younger kids show the older kids some stuff um, and just making sure that everybody does have that voice and everybody is practicing that same communication. That's one thing that I think really sets us apart from other organizations within the state of Indiana and the Midwest. I, I love that part about us. Yep. No, this is huge. This is huge. And there's so many things that we can take out of this, but the biggest thing is how do we strip our ego at some points? And I think the ego is good in some aspects. Um, George, raise your hand. Go ahead. If you've got something, let me unmute you too. <laughs> He yeah, doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how. <laughs> okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. Hey, so I think that you're touching on a really good point, but I would, I would say that one thing that I think that the, for me, the 13U team is, and I, I preach it, is that you are the standard for the younger kids. Yes. So we talk about that all the time. I always tell them, set the standard. So my, whether it's they're on the gold team or the diamond team, but then our organization or lower, age group wise, I say set the standard and I tell them all the time that when they go train, when they see the 17 year old team, I expect the 17 year old to be setting the standard. So in meets up with what you're talking about expectation is that the expectation is all the way throughout the organization. And I think having benchmark for the kids to know that, Hey, when you get to this level, this is what's expected. And we're going to continue to have that expectation. So set the standard hold the kids to the standard and that's hard because we get into that 13 14 15 year old age group where there's so much going on in their life that the one thing they are constantly wanting is that consistency and especially when you're talking about a standard so yep. i think you guys are hitting on this perfect i just want to emphasize that we need to have those groups and every age group should say you are the standard for the age group below you yep. you have to be on time for practice you have to be working hard and there's a reason because everybody's watching you. Absolutely. Now right. I'm eating myself again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, that's awesome, man. I mean, setting the standards, right? It's, it starts at the top of the organization. You work your way up. And that's how you build leadership, too. And that's what we're all about, right? Everybody in here is developing leaders for the future, no matter how big or small our nest is, no matter how many athletes we get to work with on a daily basis, if we've got 50 different coaches and 30 different teams, or if we've got one high school team and there's no JV and no freshman squad, uh, like my school was. And so there's so many different aspects that we've got, but we have such a big opportunity to impact the next generation of athletes. This was amazing. I don't know if anybody else has any closing remarks or anything, but on my end, this was amazing. There's over 50 coaches in here that took the time, an hour of your day when you've got families, you've got teams that you've got to do Zoom calls with, you've got a job that you've got to handle to just learn and be open to it and not looking at this and saying, ah, there's some slappies that are just talking about something stupid. We don't need this. But actually being open here, asking questions and growing. This is what the community is all about. Anything that we can do to help 
please reach out. Any questions that you may have had that weren't answered or that you want to answer, please reach out. If there's anything that you want touched on later in the week, send it over our way via email, via text, uh, social media. If you know one of us personally, just reach out to us and ask, give us a call. We're here to help in any way possible. We want to support the community. And like we said, encourage others to come. If you have assistant coaches, if you have anybody else in your network that you think could benefit from something like this, any athletes, bring them in. Let's make it happen. Let's blow it up. Um, whatever we can do during this time, just provide some inspiration, provide some support in an unknown time and set everybody else up for success going into this summer, which is the most crucial summer, especially for our high school athletes. If they want to go play collegiate baseball or softball. It is a huge summer. So anything that we can do to help, please let us know, Jake, Adam, Ronnie, whatever you guys got to close it out. Yeah, I think two things. One, um, you guys are, are also invited in the link that we sent to the player side, um, which might be a really cool thing once or twice to pop in and just hear it from the perspective of us also talking to the player. Um, you know, the content or the topic is generally the same, but, um, you know, who we're talking to and what we're trying to get across is very different. So you're also invited to go to those. You do not just have to come to the coaching ones. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, if you're getting value from this, like Austin said, you know, inviting, send that link to your team, send that link to your assistants or people within your program. It would be awesome to fill this thing um, with more people. You know, we, we do have the four weeks and this whole first week is focused over really the mental side and culture development before we get into skill development from there. Um, we will post the links to the Dugout Coalition Facebook page and Instagram in the chat. Every day on Instagram, we're going to just post a question in the story for players and coaches of just major takeaways um, to try to get some of that stuff and, and get an idea of, you know, what everybody's learning and taking from these. Um, and then on the Facebook side, um, for you guys as coaches, we're going to post out after these some resources or videos that might be useful for you um, over the topic that we discuss. So we'll, I'm going to post in there um, Pat Riley's Disease of Me, um, which is awesome to show your players. I know Austin's got a video from Coach Saban that he's going to put up there. So we'll try to overload some of the social media stuff with resources um, on top of just this for you guys to be able to use as well. But I appreciate everybody being here. I think this is awesome. We decided to do this roughly four days ago. We're like, you know what, let's just throw it out there and see what happens. So to have over 200 players and over 50 coaches on day one um, has been incredible. But uh, if you guys have questions, please reach out to us. We would love to, to continue that conversation further. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys hopping on here, taking the time out of your day. Have an amazing, blessed day. If you guys need anything, like we said, please reach out. Any comments, anything that you want to add in, anything that sparked a question in your mind, reach out. Um, other than that, keep doing what you're doing. You guys are making a massive impact in people's lives, whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not. And I know there's so many amazing people on here that are doing great things. So keep pushing forward. Let's keep impacting the next generation. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. See you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys. See ya. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks.